On Saturday, May 13, 2006, 18-year-old Jared Clark said goodbye to his mother and stepfather before heading out the door to an overnight camping trip to celebrate graduation with some of his classmates. His parents reminded him to be home by 10 the next morning since they were celebrating Mother's Day at his grandmother's house. Jarrett knew this. In fact, he gave his mother some flowers before leaving and said I love you to both his mother and stepfather, just like he always did. That was the last time they ever saw Jarrett alive. The next day, he'd never make it for Mother's Day celebrations, and nearly a week later, his body would be found floating in the lake. A long investigation would lead nowhere as Jarrett's classmates covered up the truth with multiple versions of what happened that night, going as far as planting evidence. It would take eight years before the first arrests were made in this case, and a decade before the family could finally begin to move on from this tragedy. This is the story of Jarrett Clark and the cover-up that obstructed justice for ten years. Our story begins in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, one of Tulsa County's largest cities. What started as a small agriculture-based town quickly rose to an active city by the 90s and the 2000s, as families established in the area. Schools and high schools were open to accommodate the growing families, and it was in one of those high schools where in 2006, an 18-year-old was about to start his life. Jarrett Austin Clark was born on April 5th of 1988 his parents, Tammy and Kevin, were divorced, but Jarrett got along with Eric, his mother's new husband, and the three lived together in Broken Arrow. Jarrett was an only child, and his mother remembers how from the moment he was born, he brought joy to those around him. Jarrett was happy, charismatic, and had a great sense of humor. His optimistic personality made him a great motivator, and he could always sense when someone needed him. Jarrett was also the kind of person to stick up for those who needed help. He hated bullying and often defended classmates who were being picked on. At school, Jarrett was very involved in sports. He played football and he did weightlifting. He was very athletic and worked out constantly. In 2006, he turned 18. And on May 11th, just a month after his birthday, he graduated high school. His next step was to join the army, where he was excited to start a new chapter in his life. But before leaving, he wanted to make the most of his first summer out of school as an adult. Sadly, he wouldn't get to enjoy his newfound freedom for very long. Jarrett had many friends in school, but he also got along with other classmates outside of his regular friend group. So when some of these kids invited him to go on a camping trip overnight the weekend of May 13th to celebrate graduation, he accepted. His closer friends weren't aware he was that close to this group, but Jarrett was very charismatic and knew a lot of people, so they didn't think too much of it. That weekend was Mother's Day weekend, so when Jarrett told his parents he'd be camping on Saturday, all they asked him was to be back before 10 o'clock the next morning, so they could celebrate Mother's Day Sunday as a family. They had plans to go to Jarrett's grandmother's house for a family lunch, and he had to be there. Being as close to his family as he was, Jarrett told his parents not to worry. He wouldn't miss Mother's Day for anything. In fact, he felt bad for not being there when his mother woke up the next day, so he decided to give her an early Mother's Day present before he left. A picture frame with his graduation photo, along with some flowers. This gesture really showed what kind of a son Jarrett was, and his mother was delighted. After giving her the flowers, Jarrett packed his overnight bag and camping gear and made his way out the door. Before he left, he turned to his mother and stepfather and told them, love you guys, like he always did before going out. Then he was off. The next morning, Tammy and Eric, Jarrett's parents, woke up and had breakfast. After that, they began getting ready to leave towards their Mother's Day lunch. When the clock struck 10, they began getting anxious. Jarrett was never late, and if he was, he most definitely would have called to let them know. As the clock moved forward and crept towards 11, Tammy got the feeling something wasn't right. She began calling some of Jarrett's friends, but nobody had seen him. Like we mentioned earlier, the group he went camping with wasn't his close group of friends, so nobody had seen him since before he left for the campsite. The family then began calling local hospitals and police stations, in case he'd been hurt or gotten into some kind of trouble. But once again, there was no sign of him, and nobody knew where he was. 
Tommy went to the police, but in the beginning, since it was still early in the day, officers didn't think it was a serious matter. They said he probably got drunk and was sleeping it off somewhere, or his phone ran out of battery, or perhaps he just lost track of time. They were sure he'd turn up eventually, but Tammy knew this was much more serious. Her gut was telling her Jarrett was not okay. The evening of May 14th, after finally tracking down who else was camping with Jarrett the night before, his family managed to speak with one of the teens who was also there. His name was Brandon Hargrove, and he had Jarrett's phone with him. Brandon told Tammy that Jarrett had left in the middle of the night after they had an argument. According to Brandon, Jarrett was very drunk and had tried to sexually assault one of the girls there, who happened to be Brandon's girlfriend. After confronting him, he said Jarrett had picked a fight with him and then left the campsite on his own, but forgotten his things, and that's why Brandon had his phone. Tammy couldn't believe what she was hearing. Jarrett had never been aggressive, especially not towards women. In fact, he was usually the one to defend victims of bullying. So when this teenager she didn't even know told her her son had assaulted a girl and then picked a fight with him, it just didn't feel like the truth. Regardless, they now knew where Jarrett had last been seen by witnesses who were there with him, and there was a chance he was injured or lost his way back. Because the police were still brushing this off as a runaway or a drunk teenager, Jarrett's family and friends took it upon themselves to search the area for any sign of him. The campsite the group stayed at was at Fort Gibson Lake, a popular fishing and camping area surrounded by forests with thick trees. For hours, the group searched the area surrounding the lake, shouting Jarrett's name and keeping an eye out for any sign of him. However, they found nothing. After dark, the search was called off until the next morning, and it took another two days before the police got involved and officially began searching for Jarrett. On the third day of searching, and finally led by authorities, Jarrett's stepdad along with investigators located one of Jarrett's shoes. The position of it was odd, since it was perched on top of a rock. A few minutes later, they also located his jacket. It was beginning to look like Jarrett may have been badly hurt, and the story of him just walking away from the campsite was sounding more and more unlikely. Finally, on May 19th, nearly a week after he went missing, Jarrett was found. Floating on the lake, not far from where his clothes were found, the 18-year-old's lifeless body was recovered. The first thing to determine what type of investigation this would be was to perform an autopsy. The Oklahoma medical examiner found severe bruising all over Jarrett's body. It was difficult, however, to determine whether the bruises had been inflicted on him by someone or if they were the result of a body falling into the water. Regardless, these bruises were not the cause of death. The autopsy showed his lungs were filled with water, meaning he was still alive when he entered the lake and drowned afterwards. A toxicology report was also run, and analysis showed a minimal amount of alcohol in his system, which is believed to even be a natural reaction of the body's fluids after dying. According to the autopsy, he was in no way drunk, like Brandon Hargrove had told his parents. There were also no signs of any other drug or substance that could alter his behaviour. With the autopsy complete, police were starting to believe this was far from an accident and began investigating exactly what happened to Jarrett Clark, and the next thing on the list was to round up the witnesses. So, who was there that night? There was, of course, Jarrett Clark. Then there was Brandon Hargrove, who knew Jarrett from weightlifting at school. They weren't close, but they saw each other at school frequently and often exchanged a few words. Then there was Courtney Manzer, who was Brandon's girlfriend. She also attended the same school, but was younger than them. Dana Hargrove was Brandon's sister, and her boyfriend, Tony Wallen, was also there. Lastly, in the group, there was another friend, Wayne Humphrey. The group was very different to Jarrett's usual friend group. Brandon was known for being short-tempered and picking fights. Apart from having a record for drug use and possession, he was a jealous guy and didn't take it well when others showed interest in his girlfriend. Many of those attending the camping trip weren't even graduating that year, so why did Jarrett go with them? It was rumoured that Jarrett had a crush on Courtney, and it seemed that she was also showing an interest in him. Apparently it was Courtney herself who insisted Jarrett should come to the trip with them. Despite it not being his usual environment, Jarrett was drawn to Courtney and decided to go and have a chance to be around her. 
Police first questioned Brandon, and his second version of the story was much more detailed than the one he told Tammy just hours after her son went missing. According to his statement, Jarrett had tried to get into Courtney's tent and force himself upon her. Brandon had then confronted him, and after a heated argument, they'd both got into a physical fight, punching each other. Then, Jarrett had taken off, leaving the campsite and some of his things behind, but the last they'd seen of him, he was alive and well. The rest of the group backed up Brandon's story. However, police noticed each testimony was slightly different than the other, and many details were getting mixed up. Courtney, Tony, Wayne and Dana's retelling had confusing pieces of information, and it was hard to paint an accurate picture of what really happened that night. So police began looking for witnesses outside the group. A woman came forward. She was there that night, at a campsite right next to the one the teens were at. She was camping with her teenage son, her boyfriend, and her boyfriend's brother. According to her story, they heard shouting and arguing coming from the campsite. It sounded like they were fighting over a girl. Her son went over there to try and break up the fight, but seeing that things were getting tense, he went back to his family and they packed their stuff and left. She said they were very uncomfortable, and since her boyfriend and his brother both had records, they were afraid police could get involved, and they didn't want to be mixed into anything. In an effort to get the story straight, police talked to Courtney Manzer again. Despite originally backing up Brandon's story about Jarrett walking away, during this second interview, she gave a more detailed account. Jarrett hadn't tried to assault her. The two of them had been flirting that night, and Brandon, being the jealous type he was, got angry. Tony, one of the other teens present, got involved and accused Jarrett of stealing his marijuana. By this point, Wayne, Tony, and Brandon were fighting, and at one point restrained Jarrett and hit him repeatedly. However, Courtney's story ended just like Brandon's did. Jarrett was badly beaten, but he was alive and left the campsite on his own two feet. The teens' stories, despite being chaotic, couldn't be proved wrong, since there was essentially no physical evidence in the case. Since all the witnesses present insisted he left the campsite alive, there was no way to know how Jarrett ended up drowning a few hours later, and as it often happens in these cases, the trail gradually went cold and Jarrett's story was left unsolved. Over 400 students attended Jarrett Clark's funeral. His friends and family couldn't believe he was gone, and on top of that, the circumstances of his death were still a mystery. For six years, the case went cold, but his family never gave up. The Clarks wanted action, but they were advised not to go to trial. With so little evidence available, it would be hard to build a case against Courtney, Tony, Wayne, and Dana. Jarrett's family also suspected the Hargroves had a relative in the force who helped keep the focus away from them, slowing down the investigation and brushing away certain tips. The physical evidence was basically non-existent at this point, aside from the body and Jarrett's clothes, so police were relying on witness testimonies, which had changed so many times it was hard to keep track of what checked out and what could be a lie, especially with the main witness, Brandon, gone. In 2008, Brandon Hargrove had been killed in a car accident just after being released from jail, where he served a sentence for drug possession, among other charges. He was drunk driving, he lost control of his truck, and fell into the water. Brandon drowned to death in July of 2008, just two years after Jared also drowned. So Jared Clark's case remained open, but it was not moving in any direction. Finally, in 2012, a new sheriff reopened the investigation to work on finally answering the questions from that night in 2006. The only physical evidence in the case was the clothing recovered from the woods and Jared's body. Upon closer investigation, one of his socks gave out the clue that gave investigators the approach of this being a potential homicide. One of his socks had signs of being dragged along the ground. If this were true, it meant Jarrett wasn't walking on his own two feet that night, and someone had allegedly dragged him at some point. The sheriff set up a tip line, begging the public to come forward with any information that could help the case. Many of the teenagers involved in the story were now adults, and investigators hoped this could bring some sense or courage to anyone who was too scared to talk before. And from the moment it was set up, several useful tips were sent the sheriff's way. The first one was from another camper who was there that night. She had set up her tent right next to the lake, in a small clearing surrounded by trees. 
This woman said she was abruptly woken up in the middle of the night by headlights shining into her tent. She looked outside and saw a white pickup truck backed up almost all the way into the water. She thought it could be another group of campers who had driven too far into the mud and were trying to get out. She didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, so she went back to sleep. When she heard a teenager was missing from the same lake she was camping at, she thought there could be something connected to what she saw, but she never came forward. Brandon Hargrove drove a white pickup truck. Jarrett's ex-girlfriend also told police that that night she received several text messages from Jarrett's number. However, they didn't seem to be written by him. Words were used out of context, and the overall style was not the way he usually texted. It made her think that they had been written by someone else. Someone who could have his phone. But the tip that gave investigators reason to re-interview the witnesses was given by one of Courtney's relatives. In 2006, Courtney was living with some relatives instead of her parents, and the morning of May 14th, this witness recalls Courtney got home and was completely distraught. After asking her several times, she allegedly confessed to throwing Jared's body in the lake after Brandon, Tony and Wayne had beaten him up. She even told them they had his clothes and how they planted them to throw off the police in their efforts to find Jared. According to this witness, she went to the police with this information, but it was never followed up. Three days later, Jared's body would be found. With all this new information, police were sure they were investigating a homicide now and decided to round up the witnesses once again and revisit the night of May 13, 2006. This is where the story the witnesses told for years began to crack. Investigators questioned the witnesses with a different approach, trying to understand if at some point Jared had been knocked out cold. Wayne Humphrey was the first one to change his story. In 2012, he was in prison for other charges, and when he was questioned about that night, he changed his story and admitted that after an argument, Brandon had him hold Jarrett while he and Tony beat him up. He said the force with which they were hitting him was so strong, he felt every blow. By the time they were done, Jarrett was knocked out cold. Courtney Manzer was also re-interviewed with her relative's story now on the table, and faced with the pressure of events finally catching up to her, she caved and told police what happened. That night, she said, Brandon was being arrogant and jealous, just like he usually was. They had all been drinking and taking pills, except for Jarrett, who she recalls barely had anything to drink. Just like it was rumored around school at the time, Courtney and Jarrett had developed a crush for each other and spent that night flirting. At one point in the night, they ended up in a tent together, and although they were just talking, when Brandon found them, he confronted Jarrett and accused him of stealing his girlfriend. The argument began to escalate, and Brandon got aggressive. Tony and Wayne got involved too, and that's when they restrained Jarrett and began punching and kicking him. Jarrett tried to run away from the campsite, but after only a few seconds, the others caught up to him again and continued hitting him. After beating him that second time, Jarrett was completely knocked out. So much, in fact, they thought he was dead. Panicked at the thought of having killed their classmate, they got scared and decided to throw his body in the lake, dragging the body to Brandon's truck and backing it up near the water, like the witness saw. Brandon, Courtney, Tony, Wayne and Dana then packed everything in the camp, took Jarrett's phone and his clothes, and left. Before leaving, they discussed their story and decided what they would tell the police. Then, they all went home. Courtney told investigators they all truly thought their story was solid and that they were going to get away with it. With this new evidence and testimonies being much more solid than before, there was finally a case to build for the homicide that ended Jarrett Clark's life. In 2014, Courtney Manzer was arrested and charged with conspiracy to be an accessory after the fact. Tony was arrested just a few months later and charged with second-degree murder. Finally, Dana was arrested and also charged with covering up. Wayne Humphrey was already in prison, and Brandon Hargrove was the only one who never faced any charges, since he passed away in 2008. All four of them pleaded guilty in exchange for plea deals. In June of 2016, Tony was sentenced to eight years in prison, along with 12 years of parole after pleading guilty to second-degree murder. Dana pleaded guilty to obstruction and was handed a two-year probated sentence. 
Courtney was given a two-year prison sentence and five years of parole after pleading guilty to conspiracy to be an accessory after the fact. The truth was finally out. It took years, but Jarrett's family finally found justice served for the death of their son. During all the years Jarrett's death was still a mystery, his family kept his memory alive. Tammy still has the flowers her son gave her that morning, dried and preserved, as the last thing her son ever gave her.